Okay, so um, so welcome everybody uh, to uh, CS 11747 Neural Networks for NLP. If you thought you were in a different course, feel free to leave now. I won't uh, <laughs> I won't be uh, make you too embarrassed. Um, so I, I think um, a lot of the people here are. How many people here are second year or ab above at CMU? About two-thirds, maybe, and then fir first year? OK, one-third. One um, so that, that's great. Um, I am going to be talking about neural networks for NLP. I think the pe reason why people uh, signed up for this class is because you realize that this is a very interesting and um, you know, promising research area that you can uh, really do a lot of interesting stuff with. And that's why I'm interested in this as well. Um, so this is a relatively big class for LTI, I think. Uh, we had maybe 75 uh, people signed up last time I checked. Um, but still, this room doesn't feel too big. Uh, so I, I think we can make it interactive and have lots of uh, discussion and questions and stuff like that. And I'll aim to do so. Um, one of the nice things about being here at uh, doing this class at LTI is that while I do tend to know a lot about neural networks for NLP, for any one of these particular areas, there's a pretty good chance that someone in this room might know more than me. Uh, so if, that is, if this is your area and you really know this well and would like to give uh, additional comments or point out things that I missed or something like that, I'd, I'd very much like that and I'd like this to be you know, uh, an interactive class where we can all learn from each other as well. Um, so this time I'll talk about the class format, but before I do so, I'd like to motivate why, uh, why we'd like to use neural networks uh, for NLP uh, in the first place. And the answer here is uh, that language is hard. Um, and we've spent a lot of time trying to solve language or get language to work uh, with computers. And just to give an illustration of this, I'd like to, uh, to test do the thing that we do in linguistics, uh, we don't do it so much in NLP, but show sentences and say, are these sentences good English? So uh, first sentence, uh, Jane went to the store. OK? Yeah? OK, I see people nodding. Store to Jane went to the. <laughs> no. um, this is probably not okay in any language in the world uh, if you translate the words word for word. So the you know it's word salad. The words are the same, uh, but we've got to get them in the right order, of course. What about this one? Jane went store. Not bad. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We can understand what it's saying, so not bad. This is perfectly good in Chinese if you translate it word for word, right? So in Chinese you don't have determiners, but in English you have to use them. Um, Jane go to the store. <laughs> so this is, uh, you know, this is something you might hear a one and a half or two year old uh, say when they've just learned how to use the past tense, but they don't quite know how to uh, make exceptions to the past tense here. And uh, the store went to Jane. Um, this is probably not OK. Um, but what about uh, the food truck went to Jane? <laughs> this is pretty. This is pretty reasonable, uh, you know. Especially if Jane was saying, "Hey, come, come over here. I'm going to buy something from your food truck." Then you know, this is something you could conceive, conceivably say in English. So if we think about the difficulties in expressing this, um, we can come up with engineering solutions to all of these problems, right? Um, so. You know, in order to determine whether these are good English or not, um, for the first one, we can you know create a grammar of the language. If we, uh, I'm assuming that everybody here has taken an NLP class uh, of some sort, uh, as that was in the prerequisites. So, um, you could write down a context-free grammar or something like that that would basically generate uh, the language, and it wouldn't generate crazy stuff like having uh, went at the end of an English sentence with the after it. Um, and it wouldn't generate uh, 
it probably wouldn't generate the store if you wrote it. Uh, it wouldn't generate store without a determiner if you wrote it correctly, although that's actually a tricky problem. Um, you also need to consider morphology. You need to consider that, uh, let's see, uh, decided is a good past tense, but goad is not good past tense. So decided being good past tense is uh, regular morphology, while goad is, uh, is not. You also need to um, consider semantic categories and preferences. So you need to consider that um, the store is not something that's likely to move, especially on its own volition. It's not likely to move uh, on its own. And Uh, but there are also exceptions. So just because it's something that sells something, just because it's a store, doesn't mean it can't move. Uh, so this is really hard, and people spent a lot of time trying to fix this. Um, have people heard of uh, the Psych Project, CYC? Not really? Okay, so this was a big, uh, a big grand scheme uh, for knowledge representation that basically meant to write down all of the common sense knowledge that people who speak English know. Um, and they worked on it for, actually maybe that past tense is not correct. They're, they're still working on it. Um, but you know, you get exceptions and exceptions of exceptions and it's really, really difficult to you know, write anything down in a declarative way. You can write down things that are useful but it's very difficult to write down everything. And then things suddenly get more tricky when you consider all of the other, uh, you know, languages in the world. You know, there's various estimates of how many languages in the world, anywhere from 5,000 to 7,000. Uh, then minus one for English, you haven't really made a big dent in that. So now uh, we have all these other sentences and there might be one or two people in the class who can do the same thing here, but, uh, but not a whole lot more. Um, so, yeah, in summary, we have phenomena to handle, we have morphology, we have syntax, semantics, world knowledge, discourse, pragmatics, multilinguality. And all of these are hard to do correctly, and all of these are much harder to do correctly if we want to do them in all the languages. So, that, uh, that brings us to uh, why we want to use neural networks. So neural networks are basically two tools to do uh, hard things, from my point of view. Uh, you ask different people, uh, you ask different people things. They might be an interesting uh, kind of thing to study on their own. Uh, but me, as an NLP person and a person who likes language, I view these mainly as a tool, um, and that's how I'll be presenting things in this class: uh, is a way to solve our problems, uh, like the problems I said before. Um, so today, uh, this is probably the easiest problem I'm going to talk about in this class, which is, uh, it, it's still a very hard problem, but the easiest problem I'm going to talk about in this class is sentence classification. So we're given a sentence, and we want to uh, decide whether this sentence is a, uh, you know, uh, of a particular type or not. And specifically, we can talk about uh, sentiment classification where we take, I hate this movie, um, I love this movie, and uh, these two uh, perhaps obviously uh, become uh, one of these c categories. Obviously the first one is probably very bad, and the second one is uh, very good. So a First way we can do this is we can do bag of words, which I assume that people are familiar with. Uh, we take, I hate this movie. Um, we basically look up uh, a vector for each of these. And what these vectors look like is basically the first element in the vector is how likely is this to correspond to very good. Uh, the second element in this vector is how likely is this to correspond to uh, uh, good. Um, the third element is neutral, uh, bad, very bad, etc. So then we basically have a vector uh, where hate would have a very high score here, maybe 2.0 and then uh, 1.0 and then negative uh, 3.0, 3.2 or something like that. And then 
Love would have one that looks like this, but uh, just in reverse. Um, then we add these together. We can also add something called a bias vector, which just says how frequent uh, are each of these classes in our training set. And we add them all together. Uh, we get some scores. Uh, we maybe uh, normalize using a softmax function, which we can talk about later if you don't already know what it is. Um, and we get probabilities. So uh, probabilities of very good, good, neutral, uh, bad, very bad, et cetera. Um, but it's very, very easy to break this, uh, you know, to break this uh, kind of model. So we just come up with something like, I don't love this movie. Uh, and now suddenly uh, we have the word don't in it, um, but what's this model going to do with the word don't? Uh, we give it a vector. It might make, uh, it might reduce the probability of the extremes, but it couldn't do something like flipping, uh, like flipping things together or in the other direction. So in reality, this would be bad. Um, and then we get something a little bit more complicated, like there's nothing I don't love about this movie, uh, which has a double negative and might be difficult for you to parse if you don't look at it very carefully. But this is actually extremely good. This is like probably one of the best things you could possibly write in a review. Uh, but it still has don't um, and it has nothing, etc. cetera. Uh, or it still has don't love. Uh, so it, you know, it, it's pretty difficult to, uh, to handle this with just a bag of words. Um, so I, I actually stole the title here um, from this uh, challenge task that's going to appear at EMLP. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but I thought this was a really good, uh, really interesting idea. So the idea is uh, there's two teams. There's one team of builders. So builders are people like most of the people in this room. We like to build systems that do well on certain tasks. Uh, then breakers are people like, uh, like linguists who think, uh, you know, I think a lot of people in the room are uh, have uh, linguistic, uh, you know, experience as well. But in, within linguistics, there's a concept of minimal pairs where you basically take one, uh, one sentence and do a minimal change of it uh, to try to turn it into another sentence. And so the linguists then go in and do a minimal change to the sentence and try to break the systems. Uh, and I think the linguists will do very well at this task because <laughs> I don't think our systems are very robust to the kind of things that people the kind of attacks that people could come up with. But uh, it, it might be worth checking this out. So, you know, at first we can, um, one way we could solve this is by coming up with combination features. So if we have don't and love in the same sentence, then probably, uh, then probably this indicates that, you know, it's not as positive as it would be normally. Um, if we have nothing if we have don't I love and nothing, this might be indicative of the phrase nothing I don't love, uh, which is, uh, you know, a, a good phrase. Uh, this is kind of a stretch because I'm still working within the bag of words model, but uh, you, you know, if you combine these features together, you can end up, uh, you can end up with something significantly more powerful than you had before. Um, so, the basic idea of neural networks, um, if for people who aren't familiar, is they're really, really good ways to pick out combination features, to take in, you know, multiple pieces of input, combine them together in kind of fuzzy ways, and um, and uh, do something useful with them. So, the example of this here is we do our four words. We look up uh, something about them here. Um, then we take a neural net and we use it to do some complicated function to extract combination features. Um, we use these combination features to calculate scores and uh, then we do the same thing. We, uh, we calculate the softmax and get probabilities. And suddenly, uh, because we're able to handle more complicated phenomena, uh, we get uh, better, uh, better accuracy. Um, so you know, this is, if that's all there was to it, then I wouldn't be teaching this class because <laughs> I, I 
we wouldn't have much to teach. But you know, obviously, it's more complicated than that. But that's the basic idea. Um, are there any questions so far, or discussion? Or? So how yeah. do you address the? You know the guy Goldberg. Yeah. Yovan Goldberg. Yeah. He basically attacked whatever I learned last semester from you, saying that you know the it's not a legit way to use deep learning to. Well, he, he doesn't agree with using the word natural language. How do you think about that? Oh, so you need to read his post carefully, actually. And he wrote the textbook that I'm using in this course. <laughs> so I think Yoav Goldberg knows better than anybody else how useful neural networks are for, uh, for deep learning. And we're very good friends, actually. Um, <laughs> but uh, what he was saying was, um, with respect to a particular paper, um, it was using a very constrained version of natural language than claiming to solve problems of natural language. And he, um, if people haven't seen his post, uh, you, can, you can look up Yoav, Yoav Goldberg medium post explosion or something like that. And <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you'll, uh, you'll, get, uh, you'll get the post. But the, the, the idea was basically that you Deep learning is great, but you shouldn't be solving, claiming to solve natural language when actually what you're handling is not uh, is not natural language, or it's a very restricted uh, version of it. Yeah. So. yeah. Any anything else? Okay. Um, I'll move on. So, um, first, I'm going to give a a very brief uh, overview of neural networks. Um, so. Neural networks, uh, specifically, the name neural networks kind of uh, stems from the fact that neural networks were originally designed to model the brain. Um, uh, and you know that, that's a great motivation to have. And it's led to some advances in neural networks, like uh, convolutional neural networks, who are somewhat inspired by how, uh, how our brain processes information. But um, in reality now, the neural networks we use in NLP have absolutely nothing to do with the brain. They don't resemble what we're doing in the brain whatsoever. Um, although some people, you know, occasionally try to say this is how uh, this is how our brain works, or this is how babies learn, or something. But a a more uh, a more accurate way to say neural networks is a string of functions that are differentiable, or more accurately, subdifferentiable, but basically differentiable. Um, and that we can use to combine together to get compli more complicated functions. Um, and a good way to express that, um, a kind of intuitive and straightforward way to express that is with, through computation graphs. Um, so a computation graph basically um, consists, uh, or we use a computation graph to express a mathematical expression. So if we start out with the very simple mathematical expression x, basically this is a, a node in the graph. Um, so uh, it's also useful to call it a labeling of a node in a graph. So um, uh, you'll see what I mean later, but it's basically a node in the graph. Um, and a node is basically, it represents a value. Um, and the value is, uh, it could be a scalar, uh, a vector, a matrix, or a tensor. Um, basically, a scalar is zero dimensional. It doesn't have any dimensions uh, to count. Uh, a vector is one dimensional. It has a length, and that's it. A matrix has the number of rows and columns. And then a tensor has, uh, is a generalization that has n dimensions. So you could view a vector as an, a one dimensional tensor. A matrix is a two dimensional tensor. Um, then we can also have other nodes in the graph that are basically um, functions of their input like this. So you'll notice the expression up there changed to x transpose. So we can view x transpose as the node uh, where we apply the transpose operation to the input x. Um, and so an edge represents basically a function argument, uh, the input to the function transpose. 
And it also represents a dependency between, uh, between these, uh, between these nodes. And a node with an incoming edge is a function of the, of the tail node. And a node uh, knows how to compute its value uh, and the value of its derivative with regard to each argument. So I mentioned that neural networks are basically strings of differentiable functions. Um, this is important for learning. Uh, they need to be differentiable uh, in order to learn. Um, so each node or each expression that we apply has to know its derivative. And then we can also have uh, nullary, unary, binary, nary functions. Um, so it, an example of a binary function uh, would be a matrix multiply like this, or matrix vector multiply. Um, we can also multiply by x, for example. So uh, computation graphs are directed in the cyclic. Ignore the in dinet part. We'll talk about that later. Um, and uh, we can do all kinds of stuff, uh, tricky stuff. Um, we could also do something where we define a special um, x times transpose times a times x node if we use this frequently, but um, it's less important to, uh, it's not super important to do that. And then basically we combine all these things together uh, and then we have a sum operator at the end and we get this, uh, we get this function. So this is our final function of interest that we want to calculate, uh, which is basically a, a kind of polynomial, uh, a vector polynomial expression here. Um, so that's the shape of the graph. Is, is everything clear here? Yeah. Okay. So as I mentioned before, Variables are basically labels on nodes. So if we say y equals this expression, what we mean by y equals is this um, particular node is, uh, this particular node, which is the result of all this computation is named y. So we, uh, we basically set y uh, um, to be equal to this node. Um, so there are algorithms that we can perform over these computation graphs, and this is how we do neural network uh, evaluation and training. Um, so the first one is graph construction. That's what we just did. Um, we just built up the graph by applying, uh, by gradually applying operations. Um, then forward propagation or forward value computation. Uh, basically what we do is in topological order, we compute the value of the node given its inputs. So um, Oops, sorry, press up. There we go. Um, so an example of forward propagation, we start out with our inputs. So all of our inputs we assume are given. Uh, we assume we don't have to do any calculation and they're given to us by the, uh, by the function. And then now we go in topological order over uh, all of these nodes here. So this is a... Uh, these are the nodes that currently are ready to be computed. So we, we walk over um, and maybe compute this one. Uh, it becomes X transpose. We compute this one um, to calculate that value. Step over like this until we uh, finally get our final value. So the important thing here is that each operation we're doing is a simple operation. It's a sum, it's a transpose, it's a matrix multiply. Um, but by combining together these, uh, these complicated operations, we can get uh, something more uh, significantly more sophisticated. Um, so are, are there any questions about this or clear? Okay. So, our second set of algorithms uh, are back propagation, um, which prop processes the examples in reverse topological order and calculates the derivatives of the parameters with respect uh, to the final value. Um, in most cases, the final value is a loss uh, function. I'm not gonna talk about this, uh, this class, uh, but basically it's an example of how poorly you're doing on your uh, 
on your task, let's say sentence classification. Um, and then uh, after that, uh, and so when I say reverse topological order, it's basically exactly the same thing we did in the forward pass, except we're calculating the derivatives in the backward, uh, in the backward direction. And like the forward pass, because each function, each elementary function is a simple function, it becomes very easy to, to do this. And then um, finally, we do, uh, if we're training a neural network, we do a parameter update. Again, I'm not going to talk about this a lot. I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail next class. Um, but basically, once we have the derivative of the loss of the uh, loss function with respect to the parameters, we can move the parameters in a direction that reduces the loss function. So, um, so this is the basic idea and uh, how we're able to train things. Um, so I should mention that uh, there are reading materials for this class, which I'm going to cover later. Um, for, some, for many people in this class, I think this part might seem very slow, and there's lots of stuff that you know already. For some people in this class, this might seem very new, and there's lots of stuff that you don't know at all. Um, in order to kind of balance, uh, in order to kind of the ba balance uh, between these people who have uh, who know this already and people who don't know this very well, um, the first week I've assigned lots of reading from Yav Goldberg's book. Uh, so it, it's a very, um, it's very uh, well written in that it's not complicated. It's not overly complicated and just explains the salient, uh, salient concepts. But still, there might be things that you don't understand, in which case I encourage you to ask, us, uh, ask me or the TAs. Um, uh, I should mention the book. Uh, if you're in CMU, we have a contract with the publisher, so you can download it for free, um, which, is, which is a good thing also. Um, so let's move back to a concrete example. Um, so. In this class, uh, this class is going to be relatively um, implementation and implementation example heavy. So the idea is basically I'm going to talk about uh, I'm going to talk about things for the first maybe half of the class or slightly more, and then we're actually going to show how these uh, ideas are put into practice and maybe try it out on data and uh, and you know observe what goes on there. Um, in order to do that, you could implement everything in MATLAB. Uh, which is uh, what really hardcore neural network hackers do, but I don't encourage you to do that um, because now there's a huge number of very nice neural network frameworks that make your job much, much easier. Um, so roughly in chronological order, um, Theano is a, a neural network framework that came out in, I checked uh, the GitHub commits, uh, the first like log on GitHub, and Theano was actually 2008. It might have been around before then, but its first Git commit was then. Um, and then there's also other things like Cafe. Um, there's Dynet, uh, which is the framework that I'm making and we're going to talk about a little bit more in class. There's Chainer, um, MXNet, uh, TensorFlow, and PyTorch. Um, these are splits into the left side and the right side. Does an observant person uh, know what the difference between the left side and the right side is? Yeah, very good. Static and dynamic. So the idea um, here is, uh, so um, I, I will, um, I, I have reasons for recommending dynamic frameworks, which I'll explain in a little bit. Um, so, but anyway, static frameworks are on the left, uh, dynamic frameworks are on the right. And um, actually, uh, kind of the bottom two are uh, uh, static frameworks are, uh, are in very active development and they've kind of realized the necessity to have dynamic computation of some sort. So uh, there's TensorFlow Fold and uh, MXNet Gluon, which are kind of ways to fit dynamic stuff within uh, uh, these frameworks. Um, but uh, I, I can talk a little bit more about those later. Um, but the basic process for training in a dynamic uh, network framework is that we um, 
we first create a model. We define our model parameters that we'd like to use. Um, then for each training example, we create a graph that represents the computation that you want to do. So like I said, we like you saw the polynomial before, we define uh, that graph. Um, we calculate the result of that computation. And um, if training, we perform back propagation and update. Um, so the way this contrasts to static frameworks, which I probably should have put on the slides, but I, I realize now that I didn't, is static frameworks, you create a graph uh, that represents the computation you want to do uh, before you start processing any data whatsoever. So if you're familiar with TensorFlow, you basically design your, your, uh, your neural network, and then you pass the data to that neural network that you've already designed uh, using data iterators and stuff. And, Static frameworks have some very nice advantages, like they're easier to parallelize, it's easy to queue up lots of data and process things, uh, and process things. but the disadvantage of them is that they kind of uh, make you fixed in to do a particular type of computation at the very beginning. And because of that, for natural language processing, where we have lots of uh, dynamic structure and, uh, and uh, more complicated things than just um, like a, a fixed size image, for example, uh, dynamic frameworks tend to be much more useful. And I think most people uh, who have tried both uh, will agree. Um, and in particular, I'm going to be giving code examples in Dynet. Uh, the biggest reason for this, I won't lie, is because I made it and I'm, <laughs> I'm much better at programming in Dynet than anything else. Um, it also has another, uh, a couple advantages. Um, it's intuitive. Uh, this is true for all dynamic frameworks, I think, compared to TensorFlow or Theano. Uh, in general, it's, uh, it's easier to um, program in, for example, native Python uh, code as opposed to uh, doing complicated things. Um, it's also fast for complicated networks on the CPU. Um, it's faster than Autodiff libraries, Chainer, PyTorch, uh, MXNet, Gluon. Um, I, I actually profiled something uh, against PyTorch recently, uh, and it took 14 seconds to train a tagger on PyTorch and 1.7 seconds to train on Dynet. Uh, but the PyTorch people realized that, uh, or found that, uh, that profiling result, and now they're trying to fix PyTorch to make it faster. So um, within a, a month or two, PyTorch might be uh, a similar speed to Dynet, but I think it still won't be quite as fast because we're making certain sacrifices in the design of Dynet, like uh, how we allocate memory and stuff, uh, which makes it kind of inherently fast. Um, it also has some nice features, which maybe I'll talk about on Thursday, uh, that make implementation easier, which is uh, stuff like automatic uh, batching, et cetera. Um, the other really good choice would be PyTorch for this class. I think, um, Max, you know PyTorch, right? A little bit, okay. So uh, my, main, my main concern was whether the TAs could give feedback about, uh, about your assignments in PyTorch, and it sounds like they can. So I would recommend, um, I'd recommend using either Dynet or PyTorch in your implementation. Um, Chainer is very nice, but it's uh, incredibly slow on CPU. Um, MXNet Gluon is very new and kind of untested. If you feel adventurous and want to try to use MXNet, you can try, uh, try that and tell me, uh, but we won't be able to give you any feedback uh, on your assignments unless we, uh, unless we study it ourselves. Um, so anyway, I'd, I'd like to give some examples. I'll be giving lots of examples in class. So um, this is the first example here. Um, the... Uh, Basically, this is a very simple thing uh, to calculate a, uh, a function and use it to calculate a value uh, from two vectors. So first we import the library, of course. Um, Dynet, at the beginning of training, every training example, you have to renew the computation graph and basically uh, clear it out for your next computation. Uh, this is a result of our memory allocation uh, that makes it fast, for example. So th that's why you need to do this. Um, then there's also, uh, you can do inputs of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You can add the vectors together and multiply them. Uh, 
and add a constant, concatenate them all together and print the value like this. Um, one kind of uh, tricky thing about Dynat, which has a reason, uh, which has a reason, but it's uh, you need to understand it at first, is that uh, when you're writing out the computation graph here, you're just defining the computation graph. You're not doing any actual computation. So basically, this v6, this is um, a node in the computation graph. It's not an actual value. And then to get the actual values, you have to call this np, uh, this np value function, which will uh, return the value as a numpy, uh, numpy array. So um, this is a node in the computation graph, or also uh, also called an expression. And then this is the actual uh, array of results of your computation. So we actually, um, if you use a profiler, you will, uh, you'll notice that all of the work is being done here. All of the time is being spent here uh, because that's where the computation is going on. Um, so yeah, so what you do is you create basic expressions. You combine them together using operations. Um, the expressions result symbolic computations, so they don't actually represent values. They represent symbols in the computation graph. Um, and then you can perform uh, actual computation. Um, so we have models and parameters. So parameters are the things we'd like to optimize over. Uh, they're vectors or matrices. Um, and then the model is a collection of parameters. Uh, actually, I think, it, sorry, the, these slides uh, I've used other places and I've realized they're a little bit old. The model is actually now called a parameter collection, which makes it more obvious that it's a collection of parameters. Um, and the parameters uh, live in the model and don't live in the computation graph. Um, so if we want to define parameters, let's say we want to do a matrix multiplier, an affine, affine transform, which is a matrix multiply plus a vector. Uh, we, define, uh, we define parameters like this. Um, and then we input our vector. Um, we input our parameters. So every time you use the parameters, you actually have to input them into the computation graph because these parameters are stored in the model, uh, not, um, not in the computation graph. And then we uh, do a multiplication like this, and we can calculate the result of our computation. Um, yeah, you can do parameter initialization. Maybe I'll, I'll talk about that uh, later. And then we have something called a trainer. So this is what does the updates of our parameters. Um, we can compute gradients by calling the backward function from a node representing a loss function and the update uh, to update the model parameters using the gradients. Um, so this is an extremely simple instantiation of uh, a training algorithm in neural networks. So what we do is we, uh, we define the model up, the, up top. Uh, we define a trainer using uh, SGD, which we can talk about uh, next time. Uh, we add parameters, uh, then we loop through uh, doing some sort of calculation and, uh, and doing the uh, backward step in the update. So what we're actually doing here is for 10 times, we, will, uh, we have a vector of parameters that's 10 long. Uh, we input the parameters into the computation graph, we calculate their dot product. We calculate the, uh, the forward, and then we calculate the backward, and we do the update. So what this is going to do is this is going to try to reduce the value of this dot product here. Um, so if we ran this for more than 10 iterations, if we ran this for 1,000 iterations, uh, does anyone have an idea of what the result of this computation would be? This is a a short quiz, or what the result of this process would be. So what we're doing is we're, um, we're calculating gradients, and then we're taking a step in the direction where we would like to reduce the dot product between the parameters, uh, parameter vectors. Uh, that would be a very good answer if we had two vectors, but we actually only have one vector. Any ideas? It becomes zero. Yeah, exactly, zero vector. So the dot product, if you take a dot pro a vector with a dot product of itself, it would become zero. So um, 
this shows how you can get a zero vector, which is not very interesting. NP.0 is just much faster than this. Um, but this is uh, the simple example here. Um, yeah, and we have lots of different ways to do training. Yeah. Sure. So the model, uh, I can explain this a little bit more concretely, but basically, basically we have a model that lives over here with all our all our parameters like W and B and F, uh, not X is not, but let's say uh, C or something like this. And then we create a graph. And when we call this, uh, or let, let me say this is PV. Um, when we call this uh, die dot parameter PV function, what this does is it moves it over here and it assigns it to V. It moves it into the computation graph. Um, so then what we're optimizing over, what trainer.update does, you'll notice at the very beginning, uh, trainer.update is defined with a model. Um, so it's optimizing over that model, basically. So it will optimize all the parameters in this model. It will optimize them even if they aren't used in a particular uh, instance of the graph. So. Um, does this make it any more clear? Yeah, so, so the question is, if you don't want to optimize over it, you don't put it into the model, and yeah, basically. Um, you can also, uh, there's also ways to put, get, have parameters in the model that you don't optimize at a particular training step, but that's kind of advanced, so I, I won't cover it here. Yeah. So the actual loss that we optimize over uh, is the output of V2 dot factor? Um, the, yeah, yes. And what if we have multiple uh, backwards uh, before the updates? Um, then the, um, the gradients will be accumulated in the model. And um, then when you call the update, they will be used and cleared to zero. So for example, let's say you wanted to iterate over 10 data points before you did an update. You could do that by just calling backwards 10 times and then calling update after the 10th one. So any other questions? OK. So. Um, so yeah, sorry, I already covered that. Um, so now, th this was all very elementary and, and you know not related to NLP whatsoever. Um, but I have a, a couple example implementations. Um, you'll notice on the course website, I have code uh, examples posted um, that you can download and try to run yourself if you want. Um, but the first thing we'll do is uh, basically a bag of words classifier. Um, so the bag of words classifier was exactly what I talked about before. Um, we, um, we look up things like this, we add them together, uh, we get scores, uh, and we calculate probabilities. Um, so in order to interpret the vectors, uh, basically each word has its own five elements corresponding to very good, good, neutral, bad, very bad. Um, so th that was exactly what I just had up here. You know, hate, uh, hate uh, would have a, a high value for very bad. So let me, um, let me pull this up if I can find my mouse. There we go. Um, So, so this is an example. Sorry, I'm 
good at neural networks, but apparently bad at uh, manipulating user interfaces. <laughs> I can't figure out how to get that. Okay, there we go. Um, so here is our, uh, here's a code example, which I'll make a little bit bigger. Um, so we import all our libraries. Um, we Im import uh, all the libraries we'll be using like, uh, like this, uh, default dict, etc., and run, and hopefully it won't crash. Okay. Um, so then the next thing that we need to do, um, uh, sorry, I kind of skipped this over in the explanation, but when using neural networks for NLP, uh, basically, we need to convert words into uh, integer IDs. Um, so we have an integer ID um, where each word in our vocabulary is assigned to this. And then we might also have an unknown word ID here. Um, so um, this is a little trick to get integer IDs if you don't, uh, if you don't know this already. Uh, you can use a default dict where the lambda is equal to its length. Um, but that's uh, not super important. Um, and then we read in, um, uh, this is a function to read in some data. And let me show you, uh, let me show you what the data looks like. This is data um, from a sentiment, uh, from a sentiment corpus, uh, like the one that I showed before. Um, So this is an example from the training set. Um, and basically, these are all movie reviews, where each of the movie reviews on the left side has a tag, where the tag 1 or tag 0 is very bad, tag 4 is very good. So you can see the rock is destined to be the 21st century's new Conan, and that he's going to make a splash even greater than Arnold Schwarzenegger Jean-Claude Van Damme or Steven Seagal. Um, this seems like very good to me, but uh, for some reason it's labeled <laughs> good. Um, and then you have a bunch of, uh, of kind of good ones. And then you go down to zero, a sour little movie at its core, an exploration of the emptiness that underlay the relentless uh, gaiety of the 1920s. The film's ending has a what was it all for? So that's pretty brutal. I can see that being very bad. Um, this also explains why language is hard, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> these, are not, these are not simple sentences and we're being expected to classify these. Um, so, so let's try to process this data. Um, what we do is we basically split it on this bar, bar, bar thing. Um, then for the thing on the right, uh, we split it into words and then we assign each word to an integer ID. Uh, for the thing on the left, we assign, uh, assign it to a tag ID. So we can do this. Um, so we just read in the data set. Um, then uh, if we want to examine the data set, we can see, uh, we can print out the first sentence of the training corpus. And we can see that it's basically uh, read in as a, uh, as a list of integers. And then we can take in the, se the second part of the training corpus. And this is, uh, this is a label zero. Um, so then we start uh, Dynet and define a trainer. This time we'll use a trainer called Adam, which I'll explain later. Um, we define the model. Um, so in this case, our model uh, is basically a thing where we want to look up a vector uh, of length five um, for each word. So. Dynet has a concept called lookup parameters. So basically what we do is we, uh, we say we want to look up something of length n tags, a vector of length n tags, and each of those uh, will have n words worth of those things to look up. Um, then we also have our bias vector of length n tags. So this is the, the vector of length five. Um, then we have our calculate scores function. So at the calculate scores function, we renew the computation graph because that's what we do. Um, we then look up 
uh, vectors for all of the words and um, we add them together. Uh, we take the bias uh, parameter, we add it to the score, and then we return it. And then we have this big training loop. Uh, within the big training loop, basically we do 100 iterations uh, for each um, set of words and tags in the training data. We calculate the loss function using this uh, this magic function pick neglog softmax, which I'll talk about later. Uh, <laughs> if you don't know what it is, uh, don't worry, you'll know on Thursday. Uh, we add up the loss, uh, we do the backward step, etc. So um, then in the end, we do evaluation. So we calculate the scores um, and we calculate the, the value for the scores in the, uh, in the examples in the dev set. Uh, we calculate the maximum label and if it's equal to the label that we're trying to predict, uh, we get one correct and we print out our accuracy. So I, I think this is about 40 or 50 lines and you can build a sentiment classifier uh, that kind of works. So let's run this and hope I didn't break anything. Oh, I didn't break anything. Um, I didn't break anything, but normally this is 0 0.4 seconds. Uh, but right now it's uh, 3.29 seconds simply because I'm recording video. <laughs> um, but nor normally this is super fast uh, and you get results immediately. <laughs> but, um, but my computer is under heavy load at the moment. So uh, I'll have to rethink this when we start using more complex models uh, <laughs> later because it will really slow down my demos if I try to demo anything. Oh, well. Um, okay. So yeah, that, that's the basic thing for implementing bag of words. Uh, but bag of words is not, um, is not super interesting. Um, and we would like to do something more complex, which is why you're in this class, uh, as opposed to you know, some, other, some other class that didn't use neural networks. But are there any questions about this so far? Yeah. Can I get the code on the left? Yeah, this is uh, linked from the, uh, linked from the uh, class site. If it, if it isn't, please tell me and I'll, I'll link it. Yeah. Are, we, are we going to talk about the course format? Or yes, I am. Um, I realize I only have 20 minutes left, but I think it should only take about 20 minutes. So, yeah. uh, maybe, maybe I'll accelerate to that. So let's, um, let's take an example of, uh, let's skip one example. Um, so I'll, I'll just explain it very briefly. So we have the, um, the continuous bag of words. Um, so what this is doing here is this is adding things together um, uh, like this, but instead of using these directly in the predictions, we treat this as a feature vector, and then we multiply this by a weight matrix uh, before uh, adding our bias and doing our predictions. So these red vectors here no longer have to be of size five. They could be of size 64 or something like that. Um, and then as always, we, uh, we make our prediction. Um, so in this case, what do our vectors represent? Each word basically has features. Um, some features might be, is this word an animate object? Another feature might be, is this a positive word, etc. Um, and then we sum these features, then uh, use these to make uh, predictions. Um, but this is less interesting. And uh, the reason why it's less interesting is basically it still only has the expressive power of a, uh, of a linear model. Um, but it has uh, some dimension reduction included uh, therein. Um, so it becomes more interesting uh, when we take these feature vectors and then we, uh, we run them through a nonlinear function like this. Um, I'll talk more about the nonlinear functions we use, but basically the reason why this is interesting is uh, by combining things together using a nonlinear function, these purple vectors here can learn combination features. Uh, and as I mentioned before, combination features like not love, don't, uh, don't hate, et cetera, are very informative. Um, and then maybe we'll run it through another layer like this. Um, and add it to our bias and scores. And now our, uh, now things start to get interesting. 
um, we can learn these feature combinations like feature one and feature five and capture things like, uh, like not and hate. So I will very briefly demonstrate, I won't actually run, um, I won't actually run this because as, uh, as was very rightly pointed out, we should talk about the class format. Um, but I will uh, just show what it looks like here, um, which you can also review later. But basically the idea is now we add some extra parameters to this model. The, these parameters uh, correspond to these, uh, the weight matrices in the linear transforms that I talked about, um, and uh, et cetera. And then we have a slightly more complicated function where basically we look up and sum the embeddings together. Um, and then uh, we do multiple passes over this uh, nonlinear transformation and calculate the score of the output. So um, by doing this, now suddenly we have a model that can use feature combinations. And actually there was a paper um, which I realize I have not put on the website, but I will put on the website after this class uh, by Mohit uh, uh, et al. Uh, that basically showed that a simple model like this can actually be pretty competitive uh, for uh, sentence classification. And it's uh, super fast compared to a lot of the alternatives. So yeah, this is an example. Uh, you, can take this, uh, you can take this home and look at the code if you like, try to run it. Um, but I will get into the, I will get into the class format, uh, and then we can uh, ask any questions about this uh, at the very end. So, yeah, oh, so sorry, I had a, a short interlude before that. So two things that I'd like people to remember throughout this entire class is um, neural networks are powerful. I haven't talked about how powerful they are yet, but the, they are extremely powerful. And if you give them lots and lots of data, they will learn things that you would never expect them to be able to learn, uh, is my lesson from the past three years observing how things happen. They learn things like syntax, they learn things uh, like semantics, even when you're using relatively simple models. Um, and in fact, they're, you might have heard this before, but they're universal function approximators, which means theoretically they can learn anything if you have a big enough network uh, with a few qualifications to how you define anything, but they can basically learn anything. Um, but Language is hard, uh, which is why I talked about this at the very beginning. Language is a very hard problem, and the data that we can use to train these is often limited. Uh, it's limited for certain tasks. It's limited for most tasks in certain languages. So um, the main thing that we need to think about when we're designing neural networks for NLP is basically we'd like to design networks so they can make the best use of the limited data that they're given. Um, and there's lots and lots of ways to do this. Uh, there's ways to do this by designing them uh, with the appropriate structure. There's ways to do this by picking the appropriate uh, learning algorithm. Uh, there's ways to do this by doing regularization properly, for example. Um, this class is going to focus mainly on the first one, how you define them with the, uh, the appropriate structure for NLP problems, because the other ones you can get in uh, other excellent classes at CMU, like deep learning or, uh, or stuff like this. But uh, I will talk about them briefly for people who are, aren't taking those classes. Um, yeah, so class format. So the basic idea is that there will be reading before the class. Um, so I expect that everybody here can read. Um, and I, there's luckily lots of good uh, materials like the, uh, the book by Yoav Goldberg, uh, tutorials online, et cetera, that I will be able to link. Um, there will be a short quiz uh, before the class. People who uh, were in my MT class, we had a more uh, a longer quiz. So this time I'm thinking about doing multiple choice. Uh, it should be easy if you read the if you read the materials. So it, it shouldn't be. I won't put any trick questions, um, etc. Um, in the class, I will do a very quick summary of the reading material, but I'll also elaborate. Uh, on like recent topics or uh, personal experiences or, or stuff. 
there will be uh, questions. And I, at this point, I would definitely like people in the class to speak up if you have personal experience about this, because as I said, I think a lot of people do. Um, then at the very end, there will be a code walk. It'll probably be shorter than the one that I did now because this was introducing, um, uh, introducing the basics. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about how to do an implementation of a simple model using a demonstration code as well. Um, the, in terms of how the, uh, how the course is based, it will be graded 20% on quizzes and then 20% on two assignments and then 40% on a final project. Um, the, the first assignment uh, will be mostly a survey and then also an implementation of a baseline model and running it on real data. Um, in this case, we'll be providing you code from a code walk, uh, code from the code walk, so you can feel free to reuse, uh, reuse that code. I'd, uh, you should not use code that already implements that model. Like if that, <laughs> if that uh, paper released the code online, I would like you to try at least to, to redo it yourself. And if you use parts from that implementation, uh, at least uh, explain the parts that you did or how you referenced it. Uh, the reason why is because you know it's easy to reuse an implementation and you don't learn nearly as much by working through all the details yourself. Um, the second assignment is re-implement and re reproduce results from a state of the art model. So basically, the first model can be something very simple. Uh, the, the second model should be matching uh, a paper that was, uh, was presented recently. Um, and also, for the project, um, uh, you can perform a unique research project uh, that improves on the state of the art or applies neural net models to a unique task. So I should mention there's a few recommended tasks on the website. Uh, these are completely recommendations. You don't need to follow each of them, or you don't need to follow the recommendations. In fact, if you want to do something completely new, that's extremely welcome. I'm, I'm happy to have creative ideas for new tasks to handle. But before you do it, I would like you to ask me, and I'd like to at least discuss the evaluation measure, how you will evaluate uh, uh, your, your task, because that's actually very difficult to get right. Um, and I would like to make sure that you, you do get it right so we can calculate valid uh, results. If you use any of the recommended tasks on the website or any other standard NLP task, then um, you don't need to consult with me, but feel free to do so. Um, oh, and the course is uh, groups of two or three, uh, so I, I would appreciate if you work with, uh, with somebody else on this. Um, the instructor is uh, me. Uh, as you might have guessed. <laughs> um, the, the TAs are uh, Hector Liu, who isn't here yet, but will be here very soon, uh, Max Ma, uh, and Daniel uh, Clotho. Uh, and uh, Hector is an expert on uh, co-reference and discourse modeling. Well, they're all experts on neural nets and NLP. Hector's an effort, uh, expert on co-reference and discourse modeling. Uh, Max is an expert on kind of uh, everything. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a structured structured prediction, uh, structured prediction algorithms uh, applied to dependency parsing, sequence labeling, etc. And Dan has done uh, interesting work in dependency parsing, uh, search problems, uh, etc., and also some image related stuff as well. So. Um, we, I think we have a pretty broad coverage of tasks, although, you know, we could always have more broad coverage if we had more people, but uh, you should be able to ask. Um, the preferred method for asking questions is Piazza. Uh, if you haven't used Piazza before, Piazza is an online bulletin board site. It's uh, private to only members of the class. Um, you can ask anonymous questions. You can ask questions directly to the instructor. You can ask questions uh, that are not anonymous. The reason why this is great is because if you have a question, probably three other people have the same question. So if we ask here, it's, uh, it's more efficient. Um, and in terms of the class plan, um, the, the first section is basically models of words. So if you know what word to vec is, if you know what fast text is, um, I'm going to talk about those and much more. Um, and we're also going to talk about speed tricks for neural networks. Um, the speed tricks for neural networks part, I'm going to 
prepare the materials, but it's going to be uh, by Taylor uh, Berg Kirkpatrick uh, because I won't be here that day. Um, in the second section, I'm going to talk about models of sentences. So how do we, how do we model entire sentences uh, using various methods, uh, bag of words, bag of engrams, convolutional nets, uh, et cetera, and also some applications of sentence modeling like classification or retrieval. Um, then I'm going to talk about sequence to sequence models. Uh, I teach an entire class on this in the spring. So here I'm just gonna cover it briefly, uh, basically encoder, decoder, attentional models and uh, a lot of the new, uh, the new tricks that people do uh, here as well. Um, after that, we're going to talk about structured prediction models. So this is basically the idea um, where we have some sort of, uh, I guess, dynamic programming algorithm or algorithm that works with the output of a neural network to do, um, to do a prediction uh, in a way that is non-trivial. So this includes uh, things like uh, structured perceptron, structured max margin, conditional random fields, uh, also some dependency parsing models uh, do things like this. Um, next, we're going to talk about models of tree structure. So um, shift reduce and minimum spanning tree parsing. Um, was this covered in, was shift reduce and MST parsing covered in algorithms for NLP? No. No? Okay. So I'll cover those in detail then. Um, uh, I, CKY was covered. Yes. yes. Okay. So um, I, I, will, uh, I will cover uh, shift reduce and minimum spanning tree parsing uh, in a bit of detail. And um, then we can also talk about recently there's been some developments in models of graph structures, which are also, uh, also very interesting and good for modeling things like uh, meaning uh, semantic parsing. Um, there's also a bunch of uh, advanced learning techniques. Um, including variational autoencoders, adversarial networks, uh, uh, things like marginal likelihood and reinforcement learning and semi-supervised and unsupervised learning. Um, these are things that will be covered more extensively in a deep learning class, but I will cover the, the very basics, um, but also explain why they're interesting from a language perspective. Uh, so what are the problems in language that we would like to solve uh, that these give us tools to do so? And I think there's a lot of problems in language that these give us tools to solve that it would be more difficult to solve if we didn't have those tools. So um, this will give a distinctly uh, NLP flavor to, to these topics. Um, also in section seven, I'll be talking about neural networks and knowledge. So if we have a big uh, database of knowledge uh, in the form of a knowledge graph or something, how do we, uh, how do we use these? Um, learning from or for relational databases interfacing with relational databases, uh, machine reading models and reasoning with neural nets. Um, we also have multitask and multilingual learning. So uh, we might want to do things like uh, take translation is one task, take uh, part of speech tagging is another task, and use each of these to inform the other. So we have lots of translation data. We don't have much part of speech tagging data. So can we use these uh, to improve each other? Um, also multilingual models as well. We might have lots of data in one language and not a bunch of the other. And also uh, advanced search techniques. Uh, we can talk about beam search and variance, A star search, uh, and also new uh, kind of new methods uh, that have been recently proposed in this area as well. So yeah, that is all. Um, and we have about five minutes for questions. Are there any questions? Also, this is the first time I'm doing this uh, class. So I will be making all the, uh, all the materials in a rolling fashion. Uh, which means I have materials for this class and next class so far and none for the rest of the semester. Um, so this is your unique opportunity to suggest topics that you would like to, uh, you would like to hear about. Uh, do you have any requests of things that weren't on, uh, on here? I could uh, do that. Also take requests via Piazza uh, or yes. mail as well. Um, any questions? Any, yeah. So I have a question about yeah. the computational graph. Yeah, sure. 
So um, I think we can make a loss function arbitrarily difficult uh -huh. or complicated. Uh -huh. So I'm just curious, like, how much complicated um, loss function can those uh, frameworks solve? That that's a good um, that's a good question. It the it depends how you define complexity. Um, if you define complexity as being very deep, for example, um, you might have to use tricks to train a network that is very very deep to get it to work, um, which is something I'll, I'll talk about at some point. Um, I'm not sure what other type of complexity you would be uh, you would be talking about. So one uh, another example that just sprang to mind is um, there there's variational autoencoders in generative adversarial networks, um, which I'll be talking about in the advanced things. And these are more complex and difficult to optimize uh, functions, and you need tricks to get them to work. There might be more complex functions um, that need, that people have tried and they don't work. And there certainly are times when I've tried and things don't learn properly. Um, and those don't get written in papers because they don't work, unfortunately. So um, I have a lot of examples of complex functions that work after doing tricks, but I don't have a lot of examples of functions that just don't work whatsoever. So, um, it's, it's a really good question. Um, anything else? Um, if not, uh, I'll, I'll wrap up and I can take uh, individual questions in the end and I hope to see you on Thursday then.